Chill and Shinjini. Uh, I'm particularly thankful to Dilip Asli because he's very, very tough to catch whenever we ask him for interviews. But thank you very much, sir, for coming to Money Control India Star FinTech Conclave. Um, you know, UPI, it's been quite a journey and people cannot stop talking about it. Uh, recently, at an event, Pramod Varma spoke about how it began when you, Pramod Varma and Nandan Nilekini, sat in a room and you all had just one problem statement how to send money like you would send an SMS or email. And this was barely seven, eight years ago. Did you ever think that, you know, we would reach here so fast? We, we are already crossing 300 million transactions a day. See, first of all, I would like to say that, you know, we have a, we Indians have a habit of celebrating too early. So I, <laughs> I, I don't think UPI has really reached to the potential what it should have, right? So I think it's a journey. Uh, yes, there is some milestone we have covered, but I think uh, uh, for a country like India, we should, we should do 10x from here, right? That's mm -hmm. what, uh, and, and when I say 10x, it's not just a hypothetical number, because when we started thinking about a billion a day, it appeared like a hypothetical number, right? But, but now I think everybody believes that billion a day is just 3x away, right, in that sense. So I believe that, you know, the, there is a lot more work to be done by the by everybody, including NPCI, to, uh, to truly unleash the potential of UPI, which is nothing but a 10x volume from where we are. And uh, second thing is, you know, why, of course, Pramod would have said something. But, you know, see, what happens is uh, the, the, the systems like UPI, Aadhaar, and, you know, some of the digital yeah. public infrastructure, uh, while some people might get a credit, like, for example, I being with NPCI, so NPCI being center of it, we might get some credit. But... But a lot of hard work by banks, fintechs, the RBI, and the government to actually create a successful DPI, right? So I think it's a it's lot of efforts by the ecosystem to get to a platform like Aadhaar or UPI for that matter. And, uh, and I think it's just we are still there at a right growth curve, and I, I think we should not lose an opportunity to scale it up to 10x from where we are right now. So when can we expect 1 billion transactions a day? So again, we think about this daily, you know. I'm saying I wanted it tomorrow, but I'm saying that, you know, realistically, I think if all of us continue the efforts, it, it needs investments, right? Because we need to get some more, uh, you know, at least 100 to 200 million users on UPI. We need another 25, 30 million merchants. So both demand and supply, multiplier effect, we'll get it there. Some of the use cases like mobility and those kind of things, which are yet not yet, yet operating on cash has to come inside. So I, I believe that two to three years is a good time period to, to assume that we'll reach billion so a day. one billion transactions a day by 2025? I think so. Yeah, I think so. That's a good headline. <laughs> Harshal and uh, Shinjini, your thoughts on, you know, what can give UPI thrust or what can help it sustain uh, the juggernaut, what, sustain the UPI juggernaut? They've undertaken a whole lot of initiatives from... UPI light to credit on UPI to various other things, but if you can give us your perspective. I think, um, I mean, we are all building a lot of our businesses on back of what Dilip's team does, so a lot of credit to him. So investment to Vaha se mil Become billionaire now. <laughs> no, so I think, uh, I think uh, UPI is really, I think it, it, while it started as a great thought, I think the constant iterations on UPI is one of the biggest reasons for its success. That constantly um, the NPC has come up with newer and newer um, features on top of UPI, which has opened up the opportunity far m more and far wider. I think the UPI auto pay, for example, uh, when it was launched, first the mandate part, which completely changed the way IPOs happen in this country, and then the, mandate, uh, the auto pay part that came in and uh, solved a big problem for subscription payments, and now with UPI Lite and, uh, and so many more innovations are coming in. I think for fintechs like us, I think sometimes I tell Dilip that it's harder for us to keep, uh, keep, pace, keep with pace with the kind of innovations that NPC comes up with, but I think that is where the, the, the amazing part about UPI is the way the platform is built in form of a public-private partnership, right? So NPC builds the base track, the private players like us are able to build on top of it and get it to the last mile. I think that collaboration will play the key role in getting it to the next 10x, as Dilip says. I think uh, what we have done so far is that we have solved a lot of problems which are the truly transactional problems, which are the tier one, tier two problems. I think the next phase for UPA is to go to tier three, tier four, where uh, it's not just about making the process seamless and 
simple, but also making people aware on how to use it, how to use it in low connectivity, poor infrastructure areas, and that's where things like UPI Lite, for example, play a critical role in getting it to the actual downstream areas where, uh, where forget UPI, they have not seen digital transitions ever before, right? Like people mm -hmm. who are used to just cash. And while we all are proud of the growth that digital payments has seen in the last five, six years, but I completely echo what uh, Dilip says that I think the opportunity is further 10x from here, and, and there's no doubt about it. There's the, if you look at the GDP of India, right, like you're still covering like 5-7% of that, there's still a lot of opportunity for us to digitize a lot of flows. And while we, I talked about tier 3, tier 4, there are a lot of B2B flows, for example, that are still not solved for. And we deal with that on a daily basis, given that we power pay businesses. Um, while the collections are happening through digital channels, a lot of the downstream payments, whether it's paying their salaries, paying vendors, paying suppliers, all of that is still not digital. And those are large volumes, those are large uh, value transitions. So I believe, I think the next phase for growth would be looking beyond the transactional stuff and seeing what are specific payments use cases where people are still adopting to either old school methods or cash, and how can we bring in payment instruments to solve for those challenges. So basically increasing the total addressable market. Beyond. Total addressable market, definitely. I think the TAM expansion is definitely possible. Again, looking back at India's GDP, I think there's still a lot of money flows that are happening that are not moving to the new rails that we've all built. And I think the next step would be to take those rails to those, those segments. Shinshini? So um, I think um, UPI has been a wonderful journey to watch. And one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that uh, three things that have given it uh, massive uh, tailwinds. One is that when you build something afresh, uh, it's always much better to drive that than to take an existing legacy. product or system. Legacy, right? So in any case, in this country, we are not very good at you know, restoration. We are very good at building new things. So that was one great thing that happened. The second thing that happened is uh, that there was demonetization. And the third thing that happened was COVID. So a lot of the cash replacement that happened uh, with UPI has got a lot of everything that both of them talked about and innovative use cases like ASBA and various things that have come out of the NPCI um, um, stable as well as various fintechs. But the net net, the factor is that the external ecosystem has also given it a very massive push, okay? Now, if you think about stepping back and taking a BAU, uh, you know, sort of uh, stock of things and say, where do I now focus? Because now I, have, I know that this whole room is some shape or form of uh, UPI user, but who is using it for a real problem to be solved? Who is using it despite friction? Who is actually using it once in a year and never coming back to the platform? Then you start to spot the use cases that are likely to take it to the next step. So to your original question was, what's the next step? And in my mind, actually, I a little bit disagree with Herschel. He actually said both things. The bottom of the pyramid, I feel, actually has adapted to that cash replacement much faster in many ways because of obvious reasons. So like, because I have two homes in villages, I, I can tell that I travel without any cash ever. And I think that's a very good ecosystem. But it's actually the reverse, which you also made that statement where the use cases are very much existent and they are not yet productized at this stage. So the payment failures, for example, in multiple collection scenarios, to me, cross-border is a huge uh, problem solver. Just to summarize it, uh, essentially the magic of UPI in uh, remote scenarios is extremely useful. That use case is like irreplaceable mm. because cash cannot uh, uh, do that job. And the, as the economy becomes much more remote, people are working remotely, they're earning remotely, they're shipping orders and expecting to receive payments both within the country and outside the country. The nature of commerce is fragmented. There are many more small value payments. That opportunity is just so massive to kind of build that, build upon the success that uh, the system has had so far that I really, I mean, I think any number is an understatement like Dilip said. Dilip, <laughs> um, you know, UPI light, many people are saying that you know, it's ironic. UPI started out as a wallet killer in 2015 because once UPI came, people stopped using Paytm wallet and MobiQuick wallet and so on. And UPI Lite, in a sense, is, you know, you're sort of bringing back wallets. I understand the technical use case, huge number of transactions, very hard for banks to manage that volume, but you've sort of reinvented the wallet in a new avatar. See, 
Okay, look, you know, I, I'm saying we are trying to do whatever is required to do the 10 growth. And, and let me explain. So today, uh, you know, we process, and there were two issues which we had in our, our mind, right? Uh, what it means is, you know, we, we look at, when we look at the transactions, maybe up to 2,000, 2,000 to 10,000, 10,000 above, right? So the way I look at it is, you know, below 2,000, maybe the UPI could be the preferred option. The 2,000 to 10,000 might be the debit card would be the preferred option. And about 10,000, obviously, the credit card would be the preferred option. That's the way segmentation in my mind. The second problem what we were looking at is the cash, actually the issue of cash. Today, the issue of uh, why would a customer prefer a cash, right? And today, when we look at the segmentation of online transaction and a, uh, let's assume that the debit card transaction to enter data, everything takes about 10 to 15 seconds, uh, similar like credit cards. Uh, the, the, the UPI could take five seconds. Now we wanted something to give the guarantee that transaction will happen, hmm. right? And also ensure that, you know, while the four or five seconds is a, is a good time, it's not a bad time to have, but if the large scale of low volume transaction has to happen, then we need to improve this five seconds. So what we wanted is the transaction to happen locally at the mobile, right? And as soon as we see more and more uh, smartphone, high range smartphone coming up, uh, you know, uh, below 10,000 rupees, the ability to make the transaction in a, in a, in a really less than a second or less than two seconds, uh, the chances improve, right? The way UPI leveraged the smartphone penetration five years back, uh, that was another, you know, the jam trinity of honorary prime minister was a really, uh, UPI is the beneficiary of that. Uh, so, uh, so that is where we are working that, you know, let's, let's make the transaction possible in assurance that transaction will happen, point number one, so that the failure will go off, right? So the cash has a finality, right? You know, once you give the cash, there is no way denial of service can happen. So we had been thinking long time that, you know, how can we ensure that denial of service does not happen because of anybody's problem, whether it's NPCI problem, bank problem, whatever it is. So the low ticket, the, the assurance that transaction will happen on light is very high. And the second is now we have the opportunity to compete uh, much better with the speed of cash, right? Mm. So I think those were the, uh, the design considerations uh, when we started thinking about the UPI light. Because otherwise the billionaire day is not possible in that sense. Right. Um, two part question, Dilip. You know, one theme that everyone is talking about now is how UPI is going global. It's a made in India good that's going global. You recently signed an agreement with, uh, I mean, entered into a collaboration with Singapore's pay now. So how many more countries can we expect? Are there more on the cards? Give us a sense. So we, so we have been working with some of the countries, our initial discussion, RBI. Which ones? And RBI and the government uh, has been uh, kind of uh, helping to reach out to the central banks and, you know, because, see, what happens is the cross-border payments is fairly tricky, right, from the rules, regulation, compliance standpoint. So unless the two central banks come together, right, mm -hmm. it's, it's not very easy to, to implement that. It will take longer time and it will get into some uh, hurdles, uh, compliance issues or regulatory issues. So I think the way Singapore happened, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a landmark. And even, even at the G20 uh, uh, conference in Bangalore, where the finance minister and governors were there, most of the people I heard talking about the India-Singapore connectivity and how it's, how the initiative by both the regulators, government coming together and, and kind of executing this uh, was a kind of a model architecture for all the countries to pick up. So for example, we have been talking to some of the countries in Middle East, some of the countries in, uh, in Africa, uh, South America, to see that, you know, whether the globalization of the UPI rupees is, is, is possible, but obviously, you know, these kind of projects should take about 18 to 24 months time. So very early stage. But I think very clearly the government and RBI is, uh, is looking at, you know, next 10 years, 15 years to build the pipes with the way India is domestically self-sufficient now. Uh, I think the vision of the government, the RBI, the prime minister is make India self-sufficient on the cross-border with the select countries of our interest. I think that's what the, the vision is all about. Right. Harshil and Shinjini, UPI going global, what, what does this mean for fintechs in India? What kind of doors does it open, for instance, for a payment gateway, for Razorpay? Yeah, I think uh, I'll talk about as, as more broadly as India start going global. I think that's an amazing opportunity for Indian companies. And the example I'll give is of, of US, right? So. 
the reason major internet companies are US based is because internet as a protocol came from US and most of the technology around it came from US. So companies who had built there and were successful there, it was far easier for them to be successful outside US because they were already used to that stack. They'd already played in that stack. And they, when, while uh, Google, homegrown Google could come up from India, it was much easier for Google from US to come in and, uh, and win that game. I think the same, uh, is the op same opportunity applies for, when in, uh, for Indian companies when India's stack goes global. Right? And, and I think that's the work that's in progress by the government and by regulators and by everyone else. I think it will create amazing opportunity for Indian fintech companies to take advantage of that, that if, if our stacks are being used in other countries or even replicated in the other countries, and, and in some shape and form that's already happening, even hmm. uh, while what uh, Dilip is talking about is more cross-border flows, but a lot of countries, for example, recently Malaysia launched Do It Now, which was their own version of real-time payments. A lot of other countries are looking at launching real-time payments on the lines of IMPS and UPI. And if that happens, the opportunity for companies, fintech companies in India who are already built around real-time payments, who are already built who have already built, a, opened up a lot of use cases for real-time payments, built stacks around that, products around that. I think it will be an amazing opportunity for com companies like that to go in those markets and capture the, the share in those markets as well and piggyback on the success and the R&D that they have already done in India. So I think as a company, we are already looking at it. We recently launched in Malaysia because of this thesis and we are looking at other markets in Southeast Asia who are following similar footsteps. And I think most emerging uh, emerg most of the emerging world, when I'm talking to regulators and policymakers, they're all looking up to India on replicating the success that India had in digitization. I think that will create an amazing opportunity for Indian fintech ecosystem. So you, you should yeah. ask him that when Razorpay will become bigger than Stripe. Sorry? Uh, Razorpay will become bigger than Stripe. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hope soon, uh, but, uh, but I think... Uh, He's building financial infrastructure for India. Yes, so I think uh, unlike a lot of the players, I'm, my so focus is to go deep into India. So Harshil, he's given a target, one billion a day by when. So now. You're asking me a lot of targets, you should ask him also. <laughs> <laughs> no, our targets are written a lot by your targets. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm taking no targets on this one, but let me, I'll share a story. So uh, when I was in uh, Paytm, uh, I used to go to Delhi every week and I used to stay at India International Center. And... Um, Almost every evening, because demonetization had happened, and almost every evening, I would find myself sitting there and talking to some old person, because that's the type of population <laughs> that is there. And the moment they heard I worked for Paytm, almost every single time, they would talk about this one problem. And that one problem was that they didn't know how to pay their electricity bill, they didn't know how to pay their phone bill, they didn't know how to pay anything, and they needed to make a lot of payments. And their children were outside India, and, they want, and their children wanted to pay, but they could not pay. So this is a problem. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing it as an as a anecdote, because what you talked about is a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs to build on the India stack to solve for, for different countries' population. But I think that because we are such a migratory economy, both within the country as well as uh, internationally, I think that, uh, and that's why I was talking about the remoteness of money and transactions, Actually, that market opportunity is huge, both ways. So I think cross-border, in any case, the maximum friction in payment is in cross-border. So, and because we now have very small value transactions, that friction is beginning to hurt. Banking system is not able to cope. So I, I definitely think that's a massive opportunity. And you can just imagine what Shinjini said, that you know, cross-border payment, the way domestic payments are happening in five seconds, a 30-second timeline, yeah. for a cross-border, uh, making the two countries' bank account interoperable. I think it's a great achievement in that sense. Right. You know, uh, 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 um, I mean, UPI is one thing, but you're also giving a good fight to Visa and MasterCard with, you know, Rupee. And uh, now we're talking about ru Rupee credit card on UPI and credit on UPI. What kind of opportunity does this open up? So, see, uh, you know, you know, when when the NPCI started, you know, uh, you know, before that, about 30, 40 banks were issuing the debit cards. Uh, you know, NPCI last few years, you know, about 1,300 banks are issuing the debit cards now. Uh, and similar, you could assume that similar impact on variety of payment systems like NACH, IMPS, UPI, AEPS, and you know, about 1,200. 1300 plus bank issuing the getting the dbt uh, uh, directly into the accounts so i think the npci's core objective the, the when the and that's what rbi keeps expecting back from npci is we are here for inclusion we are here for ecosystem creation we are here for expansion 
So our uh, belief is the credit on UPI, the objective in next five to seven years time is how are we able to expand the market? Today about uh, 30 million uh, Indians, uh, maybe unique Indians will have a credit card. Our objective is, you know, now that payments has created a layer of about 300 million users, how uh, using the UPI's ability of the customer being real time connected, how slowly, how mm. slowly we can grow and give, provide the benefit in next five years time to this 300 to 500 million customers, right? So our objective is to expand the ecosystem. Otherwise, you know, there is no point in, uh, you know, uh, the 30 million customers who have already got the credit, you know, they keep supplying that. So uh, one objective is keep uh, expanding the market, keep, uh, you know, uh, expanding the geographies to, to, to provide that credit. The second thing is, I believe, is uh, because of UPI, real-time connected customer, contextual, I, I think the whole, the way credit is given, it's going to change. The, in mm. next three to five years' time, the way, instead of giving line, can it be on demand? Instead of giving a line, can it be contextual in terms of, you know, this is what I want to buy and this is where I think Bajaj Finance has done a great job, right, and, uh, compared to the other uh, players. So I think the whole lot of programmable money, programmable credit comes inside when we talk about the, 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 the rupee credit on UPI or credit on UPI. Um, you know, one theme that the minister and the RBI uh, executive director touched upon was the dominance of foreign tech companies in digital payments. And NPCI seems to be postponing the problem. Like you've given this extension on 30% market cap, but how is that 30% ever going to happen without, you know, I don't know, an incumbent taking away market share from a phone pay or somebody else? What's your long-term thinking on this, sir? How are you going to address this? So I've been asking Harshil to launch a consumer app. You know, he's saying, no, Harshil, I'm a Harshil, when are you player. going to do that? But I'm just saying... <laughs> I'm just he, saying he doesn't that, want to burn money, he's profitable. I, I, I don't want to touch consumer. <laughs> I'm very clear on that. <laughs> so, so uh, no, I think it's a great question. I, see, the, the, what we are, the way NPCI looks at, looks at the, the market share cap and other things is, is a mechanism to, to look at the concentration risk, right? And, uh, you know, when the WhatsApp wanted to come in, right, and it had 400, 500 million daily active users. And, you know, I'm saying everybody thought that, you know, if that kind of users come inside on payment system, it will collapse the, uh, the, the ecosystem with the load and, and, and the risk what, what they can bring in. So that's why we looked at a stepped-up approach for the WhatsApp. And, and we also came up with this whole market share. Uh, almost same day we issued the, both, the, uh, both the circulars. So, yes, I, I think the, the, the question is here, how do we make it more... Uh, participative, I, you know, today, uh, you know, we are looking at, you know, COVID time, we looked at, uh, you know, the, the new uh, players coming on to the UPI bandwagon war was, was a little bit slower. But now we see that, you know, there are a lot many players who are looking at the license, uh, TPAP license. Uh, the banks are converting the, the apps, like iMobile is live, fully live now, the, uh, the, the Pays app is coming on UPI. So I believe that, you know, next few years, will take to, you know, rationalize the market share and in terms of expanding the market, you know, not in no way it will uh, create the impact on the growth on UPI because when we look at the 10x growth is still possible. You know, we don't want to take a step which will hurt the growth of UPI at this stage because I, we don't believe the time is right. But, you know, it's a policy and when we believe the market is so large be enough, market is, hmm. there are many players in the market who can take up that load and ensure that, you know, the growth of UPI is not impacted. You know, we will look at implementing this. So will there be one more extension? See, we'll look at it. I'm saying we still have uh, about, uh, the, you know, about 21 months to the, to the deadline. We'll, we'll continue to review it. Uh, at the same time, we are also looking at some of the newer uh, methods and newer mechanism. And, you know, we look at credit, look at light. And I believe that some of the new players, uh, now the, the credit is live on UPI, the, the slice is there. Some of the large, uh, the, the home delivery, uh, the food delivery apps are going live on uh, uh, UPI. So I believe that market may balance it out, but we'll have to keep watching this. And we don't know at this stage. What are your thoughts on MDR? Is it going to stay zero? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's why she made me sit here, you know. Uh, see, basically, uh, we believe that you know, there has to be a reasonable incentive. See, payment system cannot be a large profiteering tool, right? Obviously, and, and that's a thought process which government has. And when the zero MDR came in, the thought process was, 
let's ensure that everybody adopts the payment, right? Mm -hmm. This small charge of 20 basis point, 25 basis point, which is, which is like one tenth of the credit. But what it creates, Chandra, Chandra is, a, is a friction in the, in the merchant's mind, right? The small guy, he, if he buy a bed of bread for 50 rupees, he is going to receive 49 rupees and 50, uh, 80 paisa. That creates a kind of confusion in his mind. And that's why he said, no, I need digital. Niche. Mujhe, because he compares it with the cash, right? So I have to buy 50 rupees, I have to buy So I think the, the advantage of zero MDR decision has been it has helped to get the acceptance on the, uh, at the wider footprint. And that's where you see the success of UPI. But at the same time, at the same time, if we want to achieve the 10x growth, there is going to be a huge investment needed by all the players on the demand side and supply side to, to bring in the new use cases, keep innovating, scale up the ecosystem. You know, yesterday, governor spoke about you know, everybody should, uh, should uh, scale up their system to process 100 crore transactions on UPI on a daily basis. And that, the time is now. Don't, don't wait for next one year and you know, scale up to uh, make your system capable of processing 100 crore right now. So that would need money, right? So I believe that you know the government incentives have helped us to to at least survive the uh, the, the 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 zero MDR in a, in, a, in some way. But I believe that you know someday uh, you know the, the 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 government will take a uh, decision that you know we will look at you know while charging the large merchants for example. Remember, there might be many many ways to to deal with the revenue for the ecosystem. Maybe. Uh, looking at high value uh, tickets uh, transactions chargeable to the from the merchant or create a, some sort of a service fee on the uh, on the uh, on the for the merchant obviously i think the, there is complete clarity that as far as consumer is concerned the payments will remain free in that sense right F final question to all of you we've also you know seen the minister talk about uh, how he views regulation i mean he admitted that you know more coordination is needed between various agencies, be it RBI, SEBI, NPCI, METI, that there has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. So your own thoughts on, you know, how fintech regulation should pan out, that, you know, there are no nasty surprises for founders. Shinjini, perhaps you can start in Harsha then. Dilip. I guess I, I am the only one who can say this, but um, regulators, even within themselves, have departments that don't talk to each other and that <laughs> work against each other. So forget about coordinating between regulators on the so so in fact when ajay was talking about this idea that as long as you are fair to the consumer yeah. you are also on the side of the regulator that's an assumption which should hold under normal circumstances but what is happening gradually is that with digital technologies consumers expectation is to be a to have a one stop shop so consumers financial life is coming together and regulators continue to be fragmented. And in fact, there is increasing fragmentation because as they seek to specialize more, they actually want to create more specialized verticals. So actually, on the one side, you are consolidating. On the other side, you are fragmenting. How to bring that together, the solution so far don't seem satisfactory to me. So when people say, I have one sandbox, you come there and do something, that doesn't seem like the satisfactory option. At some stage, I think that uh, between regulators, there has to be a little bit better understanding in terms of saying that if I want to distribute, I'll give you a very simple example. If I want to distribute wealth products and insurance products, I need to have different subsidiaries. Each one needs to be, you know, capitalized in a certain way. Each one needs to be compliant in a certain way, etc. Even within that, if I want advisory, it needs to be a certain way. So the whole entity regulation needs to move from entity regulation to subject regulation or whatever. I think that's the kind of thing which I would expect would help in the long term. Because even within payments, I have seen, um, like when I was in city, one of the common things we used to be that between the Department of Banking and the Department of Payment, they would be issuing different things. And you <laughs> had to constantly keep coordinating between them. So that kind of thing, I think, I hope will get sorted eventually. Hashim? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you. I think the complicated part of fintech regulation is that a lot of times fintechs don't fall under a specific sector, and that's yeah. where it becomes extremely hard. I think the minister also spoke about it, that sometimes it's hard to define whether this falls under SEBI or RBI or METI, and within RBI, whether it falls under the Department of Payments or Banking or Regulation, and I think that's where the confusion starts both for the regulator as well as for the fintech, that, uh, that there are different kind of guidelines that comes in from different directions based on different risks that every, department, every regulator is supposed to manage. And for a fintech, the, the challenge is that like, 
Uh, and I think I'll partly blame sometimes fintechs as well on that, that the, uh, the fintechs are very optimistic in their push that they want to focus on the top 80%, 90% customer. The regulator is always worried about the bottom 1%. That's and that's point. where the yeah. conflict comes in that you feel that, okay, let's remove OTP and my top 99% customers will be um, uh, very happy about it, but the bottom 1% will suffer massively after it. And the regulator will always watch out for the bottom 1%. So I think uh, while most of the regulations that have happened, if you look, at, look back in hindsight, it has actually been very productive for the country. Right? It has been amazing for the country. Right? Like, and some of these, even the most controversial ones, like, uh, like the subscription re regulation that happened, again, now if you look at it, right, like the kind of challenges that a lot of Western markets face, where you can't cancel a subscription on time, where you're unable to cancel a gin subscription because you took it 10 years back and they still continue to charge it, those things cannot happen in India at all. Now, some of those might cause some disruption in the short term, but long term, most of those regulations actually, in hindsight, have been fairly positive. Even the crypto one, right, like we are... We all were, pretty, like, the entire ecosystem was completely unhappy about it, but looking back, a lot of people avoided a lot of losses that would have happened if we were <laughs> completely open on crypto. So I believe most of the regulations in India have actually been done with the right intent. I think the only push and request, and I think that's what the minister also spoke about, is that how do we create it more collaborative? How do we bring different sector regu sectoral regulators together? Because a lot of times, fintech use cases will fall in between boundaries and in between lines. Yeah. And that can sometimes cause an issue when one one sub particular sectoral regulator gives a guideline that doesn't apply to the other sector and you are caught in between. I think as long as that is sorted, I believe we are in a good state. Dilip? See, we are fully aligned with the regulator and the government, so we have no disconnect. <laughs> see, uh, see uh, Chandra, you know, when you look at, you know, I, I, I think Harshil can comment on that, but I think last five years or so, I have seen the government and, uh, the, and the regulators have been always open for the consultations and, and for the, uh, the Q&A sessions and, and the industry interactions. So I think they have been very, very open. Their policies are innovation-led. And I think that's why the fintech uh, growth, you know, so I'm saying that we can't keep saying one side, we are growing uh, the digital uh, uh, financial services, one side the fintechs are growing, and the other side, uh, the, 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 the job is not done fully by the, by the policy makers. I don't think it, it fits into, into the, the either of the side. So we should be very clear that when we say that fintech has grown, the ecosystem has been built up, the digital financial services growing up, I think we must give the credit to the RBI and the government. I think single-handedly they have driven the country uh, to, the, to the stage where India is now taking the pride on building the digital public infrastructures, uh, the, the vibrant fintech ecosystem. So I think, and obviously there would be some issues. I, I, you know, when, uh, you know, we as a, as a country, we want to do, we wanted everything to achieve yesterday, you know. So I think <laughs> there will be always uh, transactional issues, operational issues, but I think I'm quite confident that the regulator and the government will sort it out. On that note, thank you all very much for talking to us. Thank you.